I hope you're having a great day. My name is Nathan Brummel, and today we take a fourth look at the thought of the Christian philosopher Calvin Seerfeld and his views on aesthetics. We began with a brief introduction to him, his life, and then last time we looked at his definition of what Christian art is. Today we look at his view on the fundamental nature of art. Now, Calvin Seerfeld, as he discusses the fundamental nature of work, he begins by uh, discussing his methodology for studying aesthetics. He believes that the Christian approach to aesthetics must be philosophical rather than theological. Now, this has to do with the way that he defines philosophy as, I quote, architectural and janitorial service to all the other sciences. And he says that philosophy points out the coherent, interdependent oneness of the many different forms of thoughtful activity, assists in their technical repairs, and constantly focuses their particular attentions upon the pre theoretical truth conditioning all their investigations. So philosophy involves theoretical thought, which deals with the foundation of the different sciences in which postulates the theoretical frameworks within which they operate. So Christian philosophy, says Searfield, takes its cues from the Bible. The Bible guides the philosopher. However, philosophy does not become dogmatic like theology, he says, because philosophy remains theory. So notice how he's trying to avoid a dogmatic approach to aesthetics. Now, in developing the next two theories about the nature of art, Seerfeld realizes that he is philosophizing, and his conclusions, therefore, must remain theory rather than dogma. So he has a rather humble approach to laying out his aesthetics. Now, at the heart of Seerfeld's aesthetic theory is the idea of art as symbolic objectification. Really, there are two main concepts in his thought. One, symbolic objectification, and two, elusiveness. Seerfeld believes that what takes place in art is symbolic objectification of reality, and that the fundamental nature of art is its elusiveness. Now, what does he mean by symbolic objectification? That's a big mouthful. He writes that art is a much less baffling matter than it is often made out to be. To me, art means style. Art is the symbolical objectification of certain meaning aspects of a thing subject to the law of coherence. Now, that's quite a definition. It's funny that Seerfeld begins by saying that what art is is not a very baffling matter, but then he goes on to give a very theoretical sounding definition that doesn't sound so simple. Now, the reason why he thinks that's easy to see what art is is that he thinks that in certain situations we immediately know that we're seeing art, while in others we know that we are not seeing art. This sort of reminds me of how the Supreme Court has sort of made decisions where basically they, ha they say that there are times when a person can see and know that something is pornography, while at other uh, times that it isn't. So common sense does seem to play a role here in whether you identify something as art. Now, for example, when a person is practicing to be an astronaut and he's walking around with different scientific instruments measuring his bodily functions, we have an instance of scientific analysis at work. And so we immediately perceive that that isn't a work of art. Seerfeld gives two other examples of non-art. So when an average, weary, middle-aged man flat foots it across the bare room at six o'clock at night to sink into a chair on the other side, the whole scene exudes a sweaty, tired, practical action. And Seerfeld says, and when a third middle-aged man grimacing archly halts and shuffles along with awkward finesse, pointedly repeating gestures of deliberate despair to the open air, 
you have the heartbreaking drollery, the art of the clown, he says. Now, Sirifald thinks that seeing these scenes is quite different. When you see art, it, it looks different. He said, remember, art is a much less baffling matter than it is often made out to be. So he thinks that it's quite easy with a person using common sense to figure out when something is art or not. Now, when we see something that is artistic, we right away identify it as such. Sierfeld says, and if another man sees my wife finding her way slowly down a strange street and jots down her reserve and quiet poise and soft yellow brown colors on a sketching pad with an elongated Modigliani neck, then you can have a piece of art. So notice what he's saying is that when a painter sees a woman walking by and then starts trying to somehow make a point and communicate something about what he has seen, that's art. It involves imaginative style. The artist in the example is using his imagination to portray some of the meaning aspects of Seerfeld's wife in a coherent manner. Now, the artist, therefore, differs from the scientist, the average man or the clown, by being able to perceive intently, Seerfeld says, virtually live into, apprehend, and coherently express, disclose symbolically meanings open to him within himself or discovered in things outside himself. Now, when Seerfeld says that, that makes me think of a poet and what a poet is doing with words as he's trying to be very elusive, for example. Seerfeld also defines what a symbol is. He says a symbol is any occurrence or type of occurrence, usually linguistic in status, which is taken to signify something else by way of tacit or explicit conventions or rules of usage. He thinks that a symbol is pre-linguistic and that there is therefore an important distinction to be drawn between lingual signification and pre-lingual symbolization. In his dissertation on Croce's earlier aesthetics, he critiques Croce for claiming that no such distinction can be drawn. Seerfeld thinks that if one conceives of art as prelingual symbolification, as being identical with rhetoric, linguistics, then we are stretched on the horns of the dilemma of either trying to understand the arts in terms of linguistics, or on the other hand, having to stretch one's theory of linguistics in such a way that it becomes distorted. Now, it's clear that if art and rhetoric are the same thing, then the study of art is the study of rhetoric. This would mean that aesthetics is reduced to linguistics or vice versa. And so Seerfeld makes this argument in his doctoral dissertation. He defends the uniqueness of aesthetics from linguistics. Now, what led Croce, the Italian philosopher and aesthetician, down the path of denying that a symbol is pre-linguistic is that he thinks that aesthetics is the science of expression. And he claims that expression is the irreducible artistic fact and is the, I quote, primary most elemental spiritual activity. Now, we can notice that Croce's definition of art as the science of expression is plausible, but when this is used as a stepping stone to prove that art and rhetoric are identical, it loses its possibility. Seerfeld is right to point out that art does not need to be linguistics in order for it to provide knowledge. Now, we've been looking at symbolic objectification. Now we need to look at the topic, well, what is the object of symbolic objectification? What does Seerfeld mean by the symbolic and how that is distinguished from linguistics? we need to look at what the object of the symbolic objectification is. 
Now, Seerfeld claims that art is the symbolic objectification of reality. See, art picks out certain pregnant features of reality and presents them, he says, cartoonfully. He says that artistic paintings present meaning cartoonfully, so to speak, highlighting and silhouetting the prehended or apprehended affairs to intimate certain meanings rather than give it to you in a straightforward, indicative, or deictic, logical fashion. So what he's saying is that art isn't just like your old Dutch grandma who says things like they are. Art involves elusiveness and imaginative symbolism. Art picks out an aspect of reality which we can understand. This reality is the artist's perception of some object of his experience. He is focusing on our impressions of the world around us and the special ways that artists see the world. And of course, we know that that is what makes a great artist. Rembrandt could see things about lights, light and shadowing that the normal person doesn't see. The poets are able to see elements of reality that we miss. Good artists are once again, with their macro lenses, able to see and appreciate realities that we would walk right on by. Now, Sirafold argues that elusiveness is the qualifying characteristic feature of art. Elusiveness is central to Seerfeld's aesthetics. And I think if you'd ask many poets historically and say, what is unique about your poetic artistic work? I think they probably would say things like elusiveness. That's why when you read a good piece of poetry, if you're a very literally literal minded person, you're not going to pick up on what is being alluded to. Now, Seerfeld admits that the modal reality of art being fundamentally elusive cannot be proved by a deductive argument. He says, but I do take a stand in the push and pull of historical systematic analysis, and I'm curious whether my opening hypothesis designating elusiveness as the nuclear moment of how art is qualified will ring true as a starter and meet the objections of the many who have rightly doubted whether a logically exhaustive definition of some exclusive, essential generality could ever be found or built solidly out of empirical blocks. Now, this reminds us of his attempt earlier to define what Christian art is. He realizes he's taking a daring step here when he's claiming that elusiveness is like the defining thing that makes art to be art. Now, he justifies making this pretty daring hypothesis by writing that the al alternate to taking an informed theoretical stand is the stance of skepticism. But theoretical skepticism cannot give leadership. Now, part of his interest is in talking about how we can judge art. How can there be sort of an objective approach to judging what is good art? Well, in order to judge good art, you have to know what art is. And if art involves elusiveness, then one thing you can do is you can evaluate whether or not the artistic work is elusive or not, and in what ways, and whether it works or not. Now, it is true that if one remains a skeptic, one cannot be a leader in the struggle to develop an aesthetic theory. But is there not another way out of the problem? Maybe there is not any one definitional term in ordinary language that will provide an answer to what the fundamental nature of all art is. You know, maybe what we need to say is that this idea of elusiveness is one crucial component in whatever art is. The arts are so broad and so many different things fit under the category of art that is it not probable that we have in the arts no one definition of what the fundamental nature of all art is? I think of things from also from a Doya Weirdian perspective here, since Seerfeld is part of that tradition. 
And when we look at any one thing, aren't there going to be a number of different elements to it in its creation structure? So we might have to be careful about saying that one thing is the fundamental nuclear characteristic of art. You know, perhaps what we need to do is what Wittgenstein did and claimed in his philosophical investigations. Maybe we cannot come up with one definition for what art is or what is at the heart of art. Remember, Wittgenstein used the example of games. He argued that there probably was not one definition that would be satisfactory for all the things we call games. Instead, they, there are all kinds of intertwined and interweaved definitions for the family of games. Might not the same thing be the case with art? Perhaps there simply is a family of resemblances between a bunch of different things that we call art, even though some of them might lack elusiveness, or elusiveness might play a very, very minor role in them, with other things playing a more major role. But Searfield probably should be looking for the, the certain fundamental things that the different family of arts have in common. But aside from the fact that it seems doubtful that we can come up with one simple definition of the fundamental nature of the arts, Searfield has at least made an effort here. Now, how has he defined elusiveness? Well, he, he even seems to leave it for other theoreticians to study what elusiveness is. So there certainly is something to what Seerfeld says about how at the heart of whatever art is, is elusiveness. Now, the next thing that we need to talk about is how Seerfeld teaches that art constitutes knowledge. Notice here how he takes a stand against those who try to claim that art somehow doesn't communicate anything that the mind can comprehend. He says that art constitutes knowledge. The way that artists see the world, Seerfeld says, constitutes knowledge, and they can share that knowledge. When you look at the artist's work, you are gaining knowledge about the reality that the artist perceived. You see the way that he perceived the world, and maybe even the way the world is. Whatever is meant when we commonly think of what the world is like, that's what the artist tries to communicate. And in this circumstance, we're not necessarily talking about the things that make up reality in a scientific way with respect to atoms and electrons. Seerfeld says about art giving knowledge, he says, when you know how to read the aesthetically focused off-center the on-center shape, the luminescent color, straight or crooked line, and composition of the canvas or wood, then you most assuredly gain knowledge. You gain distinguishable, explicable knowledge. But it is suggestionally qualified knowledge. And such artistic knowledge is as valid and sure, though different as other sorts of knowledge. In Rainbows for a Fallen World, he defends, therefore, that Art involves knowledge. This also takes away radical skepticism when it takes to the evaluation of art. So here we see the idea of elusiveness also coming up. He talks about how art, it gives suggestionally qualified knowledge, which be, seems to be the same as saying that art is elusive. The knowledge in art is elusive. It's, it's hard to grasp. It's not something that is just straightforwardly expressed. Seerfeld makes it clear that he is not claiming that art is vague. He says that just because art is not analytically precise, that does not mean that it is vague. Art is not more subjective or mysterious than analytical knowledge. Rather, it is a different sort of knowledge. He claims that artistic knowledge is different because it has a different set of formative elements defining their existence as art products. And one needs to learn how to read such artistic elements in order to understand that kind of genuine knowledge, knowledge characterized by the quality of suggestion and illusion. 
So artistic knowledge is real knowledge. It's knowledge of things which have elusive characteristics. In some sense, this means that you can't just write down in prose the knowledge you learned. Try looking at Rembrandt's painting of the return of the prodigal son. Now try to write down in prose all the things that are being communicated in that picture. You can't do it. It's like you can't take the elusiveness found in a marvelous piece of poetry and then just turn it into some type of you know, scientific information. So the concept of elusiveness is central to Seerfeld's aesthetics and we could say his epistemology. Now he takes issue therefore with relativism in art criticism. That's something We'll turn to next time. The knowledge that we retain and obtain from the study of art is, is not relative. It's genuine knowledge. And in our next discussion, we will see how Seerfeld takes issue with radical subjectivity in art.